Hey guys, this is MJ at His Truly, locating and educating protocols at risk in these final hours, moments, nanoseconds prior to the rapture of the church, which we know is more imminent today than it was ever, 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 ever. I appreciate you guys praying for me. I am on light duty. Um, have a torn rotator cuff. It's uh, not sure what's going to happen. I got to go to physical therapy uh, three times a week, but. Um, so here I am in a different location. Um, so I'm not in my regular library, but who's ready for the rapture of the church? I am. And we know that it is any moment. Um, what's going on right now is not a coincidence, guys. We know that. Things are happening rapidly, rapidly progressing as it should. You know, it's all like pieces to a puzzle. And we're seeing the puzzle get filled in each and every day because we read the Bible. That's what prophecy is. You know, I used to be afraid of um, eschatology, which is the study of end times events, which we are in the end times, literally in the final moments of the end of days, this generation that shall not pass away. Um, this is the end of the dispensation of grace. And then comes the tribulation. But I used to be fearful of that, you know, like, oh, I don't wanna read the book of Revelation. I don't, you know, now, two years ago, the Lord just told me, you know, you need to start <laughs> digging into this. And, um, and you know, I started listening to like Andy Woods and J.D. Farag and, um, I hope you guys had a great day at church if you fellowship somewhere. If you don't, I would recommend J.D. Farag or Andy Woods, um, jdfarag.org or Andy Woods and look at his Revelation study. Um, right now, he's actually doing a study on the rapture, you know. So today his, um, his sermon was on the rapture, so he's pretty awesome. And he puts things into perspective so you can understand. You know, I'm kind of a visual person. I need to kind of have these pieces put into the puzzle for me so that, you know, because the Bible is so many books and, you know, 66 books. And it's like, you know, in the Old Testament can be so confusing sometimes. But I'm beginning to understand, guys. I'm beginning to understand if we pray for wisdom every day. God said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him come to me and I will give him wisdom. So every day, seek God and ask him for wisdom. And oh, what revelations he gives us in that word. Oh, what revelations. God is so good. And as much as the enemy and the flesh tries to keep you away from that word, it is imperative that we be hidden, tucked away in that word, and that word be tucked away in our heart right now. That we be, our spiritual armor be on us. We know who we are in Christ in these final moments because the enemy is just firing darts. And a lot is going on and don't fear. You know, I, I know I say that, uh, I see so many Christians fearing and these, this is a victory lap for us, this final lap, guys. Um, remember that faith, salvation is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That is the gospel, the true gospel, the only gospel. Um, and so Jesus Christ died for us, according to scripture. He was buried. And on the third day rose again, according to scripture. That is the gospel, guys. And that's the only gospel. And getting saved is the most important thing in these final moments if you're not saved. Born again. How do you get born again? You get born again by simply admitting you are a sinner in need of a savior. And we're all sinners needing a savior. We're all born into a condition called sin. B is to believe, and this is key element here, belief that Jesus Christ is this world's only Savior and your own personal Savior for the forgiveness of your own personal sins. 
and see, call upon his name. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, not might be saved, will be saved. Okay, so I wanted to start that out and we're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Jesus Christ is not a religion. It's not joining a church. It's not trying to do your best. It's not works. It's nothing of human effort gets us saved, but believing. Um, the gospel of our salvation is faith plus nothing. Okay? We believe. Simply believe. We will never lose our salvation, beloved. Never. We are sealed at the moment of salvation. We are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. So John 6, 37, all that the Father has given me shall come to me, and he that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. John 10, 28 and 29, and I give to him, to them eternal life, and they shall never perish, never, 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 neither shall any man, any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Second Corinthians 1 22, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts. So that Holy Spirit is that promised earnest down payment, so to speak. So Titus 2 13, so we are looking for that blessed, glorious hope and the glorious appearing of our great, great Savior, Jesus Christ. And don't allow yourself to go into the tribulation, beloved, because it's coming up. That is next on the prophetic calendar. Actually, the rapture is the rapture. And then I don't know how long until the tribulation. And I don't know how long until the signing. We don't know any of these things. No man knows the day or the hour of the rapture. But remember the entire purpose, and I'm reading this from my journal. This is my journal, and actually this is my book, Behold Thine Enemy. I'm going to share a little bit out of, out of um, my book, Behold Thine Enemy. The entire purpose of the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, is to put an end to finish the transgression um, to put an end to iniquity. Jesus put an end to our iniquity on the cross. So we are not appointed to that wrath. We're not appointed to wrath. So people who say that we have to go through the tribulation, um, I don't believe that. This channel is 100% pre-trib, 100% pre-millennial, and I believe the actual Bible is literal. Literal. Um, and the tribulation is to purge the world of any unbelief and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to seal up the sin for Israel. Um, so just know that there is no fear for us because we are going to a wedding. We are preparing for a wedding, guys. And so on that note... This is called a Galilean wedding, and I know I've shared it before, but I'm going to share it again for some of you who haven't heard about it. Um, over the five decades, I've attended various churches. Not once do I remember anything about a Galilean wedding and how it relates to me or the rapture or the bride of Christ, which is us. We are the church, the bride of Christ. As first century Galileans, Jesus knew that the disciples had taken part in various weddings and would recognize immediately that he was attempting what he was attempting to communicate. One of the methods Jesus employed in communicating his message was through parables and with great effectiveness. Jesus was the master of parables. Long ago in Galilee and somewhat still today, marriages were contractually prearranged. The father of the groom would select the future bride for his son, usually at a very young age, the contract was signed by the parents of the bridegroom, and the bridegroom himself would pay a dowry, which is a down payment, to the bride or her parents. This was how the marriage covenant was originally established. 
Just as Jesus does not force us to accept him as Lord and Savior when we're offering, when he offers a gift of salvation, also the Galilean bride must first consider consent to the marriage, not just because her father said so. Okay, so the Galilean bride had to say yes to the marriage. The bridegroom would then offer her a ring, a gift, and a drink from a cup of wine proposing marriage. The bride would then choose to drink from that cup or refuse altogether. The covenant would be sealed if she chose to do so, and they would be legally betrothed, just as we're sealed by the Holy Spirit's promise. Engaged. Or, interestingly enough, one who is bought with a price. Just as we are purchased by Christ's blood. 1 Corinthians 6 19, the Apostle Paul tells us the very same thing. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Interesting parallel. Then the groom would tell his bride, I shall not drink from the fruit of the wine until I drink with you in my father's house. Sound familiar? They understood this precise phrase from a traditional wedding because it embodied a common union between two parties, which is where we get the word communion, common union. The bridegroom would then return to his father's house during that year to add a room to prepare a place for them. Hmm. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I, I would have told you. Would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. John 14, 2 and 3. That is the rapture, beloved. In the ancient culture, Father's house was where the extended family lived, a place of permanent dwelling. In Jesus' time, families usually lived in clusters of buildings called insulas. Rooms were often added on as families grew through birth and marriage, and as sons were married, they were usually added to the insula. To be part of the wedding feast, you had to be first invited. As it is in the Galilean wedding parallel, where the father chooses the bride for his son, God does the choosing. Christ does not give the proposal. It is God who chooses the person and gives them to Christ. Blows my mind. John 6, 39. Christ symbolizes the bridegroom of the church. Matthew 9, 15. Mark 2, 20. Just like in today's culture, the bride would be busy purchasing items to assemble her wedding dress and prepare for the arrival of her groom as she saw the day rapidly approaching. And I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses on. This print is so small. Uncertain of his arrival date, she would need to be prepared and her bridesmaids, usually under the same roof, assisted her in the preparation, often pursuing the finest portion of fabrics for her dress. Neither the bride or groom would not know what day or the hour the wedding would occur. Sound familiar? Jesus also told us that no man knows the day or the hour when he comes to rapture his bride. When the wedding chamber was complete, the father of the groom would usually in the middle of the night proclaim the long awaited news. Son, it's time to go get your bride. Woo, that's gonna be so awesome. Goosebumps. Assembling a lighted procession throughout the streets of the city, the bridegroom would blow the shofar. That's a trumpet-like ram's horn to awaken the community and they would join him outside as part of the wedding ceremony. Once the bridesmaids heard the shofar, they would make sure that they had enough oil in their lamps and they aroused the bride and promptly utilized their lanterns to illuminate the path to the father's house. The parallel, the archangel will be blowing the trumpet very soon to the very cataclysmic rapture, soon and very soon. When that long-awaited moment finally arrived for the, for the betrothed, 
the bridegroom would draw near his bride and beckon for her to sit upon a chair where she would be lifted up, raptured, oh man, and carried the remainder of the way to the wedding chamber for seven days, just as the church was to be in heaven for seven years during the tribulation. The great wedding feast would occur after that seven years, just as the church will attend the wedding feast of the Lamb. Blows my mind. The door to the wedding would be shut and any latecomers turned away. When Jesus was telling his disciples this story, they realized that Jesus was the groom and would be leaving, that the bride price would indeed be paid and that something in the future, sometime in the future, he would be reunited with the bride, the church. In the Bible, Jesus would reveal to his disciples that he was the Passover lamb that would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. Matthew 26, 29, Jesus told his disciples, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. They understood this precise phrase from a traditional wedding because it symbolized a common union between two parties where we get that word communion. Also in the first miracle Jesus performed, take note that it was on the third day, John 2, 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Remember, Christ was always accompanied by his disciples when he went to this wedding. Um, and the wine running out refers to the animal sacrifices coming to an end, of course. And the new wine characterized the covenant that the bride of Christ would partake in the new covenant. Okay, so in Matthew 24, 36, the disciples asked Jesus how the end of the ages would come and what would the signs be? Okay, take note now. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Getting the picture? Contrary to doctrinal religious views surrounding the eternal security of the believer, Jesus Christ never leaves his bride. Never. Ever performing his sacred work of redemption from the inside out, not the outside in. Patiently awaiting until we arrive at that blessed dead end and finally recognize the engagement. Only when we arrive at that awful place are we able to discern the groom's gentle knock. Sadly, because the majority of us have failed to receive discipling, remember we're born again, we're saved eternally at the moment of our salvation. Salvation is a birth date. Everything after that is our walk. That's very important because a lot of us think we have to sustain our salvation or maintain it. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, period. Okay, but sadly, because the majority of us fail to receive discipling in our spiritual walks, we haven't a clue what that knock is or even how to access it. Because most prodigals profoundly lack understanding of Christ's enduring faithfulness and because of the clergy's endorsement of the potential loss of salvation, prodigals can't help but remain baffled. That's why I do this channel. Just because we have chosen by an act of our own wills to remove ourselves from Father's gates of protection, the church, the walls, you know, brick and mortar church, we are the church. There's the church out there sitting in bars. There's church out there doing all kinds of stuff. And they are the church. You will be surprised who is in heaven and who is not. Guaranteed. Because of Jesus Christ's faithfulness. Because it was dependent upon what he did on that cross. When he said, it is finished. It was finished. Our sins, past, present, and future forgiven. Okay, so... So it is, let me see where it is. Um, so just because we've chosen by an act of our own wills to remove ourselves from Father's gates of protection, whether consciously or subconsciously, doesn't negate the fact that our true inheritance lies within those walls. Just because we've subjected ourselves to a harsh land, 
doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ bridged our entrance into that land, the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you can't get into the kingdom of God. You must be born again to enter into the kingdom of God. The only way to the Father is through the Son. At the moment of salvation, we have been transferred from darkness immediately into spiritual light, from immediately from darkness into light. So even if we're walking in our sin and the enemy's telling us, you're not saved, you're not saved. Remember, Jesus Christ is the one that bridged our entrance. It's not of works. We can't get ourselves back up, climb ourselves back up. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy just bring that to you, okay? Um, like, what's God got to do with you? You know, you blew it now. Don't, don't buy that. It is just outside those city walls that the enemy seductively beckons, tempting the bride to follow his subtle suggestions. How could any of us have known that the further away we travel, the less likely we'd hear the knock? Or for that matter, ever return alive? Unfortunately, many traditional churches neglect to teach us that the covenant of eternal security is, was, and always will be the Father's covenant to his Son. Despite our best efforts, we don't have the power to keep that covenant. It's Jesus' promise to the Father that he wouldn't lose a single one of us. When I learned the startling facts about my true citizenship and spiritual inheritance, it seemed almost ludicrous that the Father would even still care. I'd become so filthy in this world's pig pen that no one would have guessed that I was born from a royal lineage. That was precisely the enemy's plan. Only this time, it failed. My physical attire mattered very little to her father who had long ago clothed me in Christ's righteousness. Despite my false belief that I had forfeited my salvation, father patiently waited for that blessed moment in time when my heart cried out to him in defeat. As he ran down that long road to meet me, he was carrying the same coat he clothed my shame in at salvation. Only then would I realize that it was not even my coat to keep clean. That coat belonged to his own dear son, and it was still perfect. During my tragic years of wandering, I should have died, and I'm painstakingly aware that how many of us have died out there and have gone on to physical deaths only to find themselves immediately in the presence of our Savior, the one who bore the guilt and shame that they tried so hard to run from. I am alive to proclaim to the prodigal who only thinks he has forfeited his salvation and his birthright that Jesus Christ still proudly holds the title deed to that land and stands ready to deliver it back to the Father. I know that it doesn't make sense that we've traveled so far yet remain so treasured in the Father's eyes. How great the Father's love for us that we will be called sons and daughters of the Most High God. Despite our disobedience, Jesus Christ secured our betrothal. The moment we said, I do, we became engaged, sealed by his Holy Spirit. Our father never annuls the marriage covenant to his redeemed bride. He simply waits until we can clearly read the print for ourselves. Further and further away, some of us travel from that bold print until its redeeming promise is no longer legible. But the fact that we move further away will never erase the security of Christ's blood covenant. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. John 17, 1 through 5. The covenant of redemption was an agreement that involved both responsibility and compensation. The Son entered into a sacred agreement with the Father, submitting himself to the functions of that covenant agreement, an obligation was likewise assumed by the Father to award Jesus for fulfilling the work of redemption. The bride is his reward. God isn't interested in our programs or our formulas to reach the sinner. Let sin itself reach the sinner and simply make ourselves available to he who is hungry and invite them to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Guys, the tribulation that period of time is coming up. And so 
We have nothing to worry about. We are not appointed to wrath. And we are the bride of Christ. This is the most exciting time in history for us. And we should be so very blessed that we are a chosen generation. That, you know, the Bible says, what is the rapture? The rapture is when that trumpet sounds and that trumpet is soon to sound. And Jesus Christ descends into those clouds. The dead in Christ rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in those clouds to meet the Lord in the air and ever so be with the Lord. And the Bible tells us to encourage one another with these words. And, you know, I find so many Christians that are just so fearful and so confused about the rapture and the rapture is oh so targeted right now for uh, getting so much hate mail on social media you know the rapture there is no rapture there is a rapture stay tuned there's definitely a rapture it's just like they say there's no jesus okay you know why they use jesus name in vain the world is soon to see. The world is soon to see the Bible unfolding just as it is written. And that final puzzle piece, that last Gentile to say yes before the rapture happens. And soon and very soon is going to happen. Guys, I love you and I've been praying for you. And I know it's tough. I know it's tough. The struggle for me is real. It's like I wake up every day and it's like, Lord, is today the day and today could be the day because Jesus said in the twinkling of an eye he said keep looking up for your redemption draws nigh lift up your heads and look up for your redemption draws nigh in the twinkling of an eye it's going to happen and we should be stoked about that and excited and I know that sometimes well the Bible says this the joy of the Lord is our strength and sometimes we lose that joy and it becomes tedious our life our walk becomes tedious and that's when the enemy can attack us that's when the flesh can just you know kind of take over and the spirit and the flesh will always fight Re read the book of Galatians or Romans chapter 7 and 8 um, your flesh is always going to try to fight your spirit. Um, but your spirit, the Bible says the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord. So you want to continue to nourish your spirit and feed your spirit. So your spirit can take over and kick your, you know, flesh's butt, so to speak. So um, feed yourself the word of God. Listen to pastors that are teaching end times teaching right now. Billy Crone, Andy Woods, J.D. Farag, as I told you, J.D.F.A.R.A.G.org. Um, you know, I, I drive home, I listen to to it. Uh, I don't even listen to music any. You know, I listen to what the Lord wants us to do right now is to reach as many people as we can with the gospel because the hour is late beloved the hour is late and we're going home we're going to the wedding we're going to the wedding so be prepared be prepared i love you guys i am praying for you daily and know that i'm praying for your prodigal and your family that god will cover you and bless you and encourage you in your walk I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but remember the joy of the Lord is our strength. And just try to retain that joy and don't allow anything to steal your joy. Hold it close to your heart. Okay, I love you guys. Until next time, keep looking up. Our redemption draws nigh. God bless you guys.